Welcome to The World Below, The War in the Heavens, a podcast exploring the adventure, the intrigue, and the magic of a land that lies beneath the celestial battle between gods and demons, a clash that has gone on since time immemorial. I'm your guide, your interlocutor, and your host, Michael Pryor. Welcome everyone to episode 22 of the World Below the War in the Heavens podcast, the second of season three. This one is all about Queen Grappina of Anaquist, known as Grappina the Cruel. Hello one and all, I'm Michael Pryor and this episode looks at the period in Anaquistian history that begins what are called the Nightmare Years. Let's plunge in. In Anaquistian history, there have been a number of smooth handovers of the throne, with none of the strife, backstabbing and double-dealing that is pretty much the standard way of doing things throughout the nearly 2,000 years of Anaquistian history. One way to manage a smooth handover is to make sure that there's no one to oppose your taking of the throne by slaughtering all of the possible contenders. Grappina Anaquist did just that, and in doing so ushered in the period of Anaquistian history known as the Nightmare Years. Before we really dive into this period of unrelenting terror, a note about the sources. It's a pretty simple note because we don't have much from this period. Our usual primary sources from the early days of Anaquist come from people with enough time to sit down and write... And during the nightmare years, these people were usually living in fear of their lives and not really thinking about jotting down a few lines about the political and financial state of Anaquist. On top of that, Grappina and her descendants were fond of a bit of scroll burning and defacing of monuments, obliterating the past and making it in their own image, being part and parcel of their reign of terror. The nearest sources we have are written once the Anaquist dynasty is restored, and so... They're looking back more than 100 years to the events. It's the best we have, so we'll make do. The overview. overview, overview, overview. It was most likely that Grappina was born in 292, but there's some vagueness about that and about her exact birthplace. Her father was Salus, one of the offspring of Queen Sendia II. He left Anaquist soon after reaching adulthood and spent most of his life as a military commander in various city-states and kingdoms across the continent spending most of his time as the commander of a number of Jaloxian mercenary companies. Jalox, the large inhospitable island to the south of the continent, had already gained a reputation for providing top-quality military forces to whoever wanted to pay for them, and Salas became well known as a hard-headed leader of the fierce troops under his command. There are mercenaries and then there are mercenaries, but the Jaloxian companies were very, very mercenary pragmatically vicious, shall we say? It's possible that the young Grappina observed some of the methods that her father and his followers used, and these may have formed her notoriously ruthless outlook. Later, she gave differing accounts of her age and her place of birth, and it's believed she enjoyed the aura of mystery that this cultivated. Grappina spawned a mini-dynasty of four children who achieved notoriety of their own, having been raised in her image. Zalman the Vicious, Yefen the Bloody, Enna the Inhuman, and Keska, who was so malevolent she didn't need a cognomen. Grappina's children had three different fathers, all of them junior officers, in her father's Jaloxian mercenaries. She reigned from 339 to 371 when she died at the age of most probably 78 or thereabouts. Now, that doesn't sound so bad, does it? And the bare bones are benign, provide and uh, lead out all the bloodiness of her accession and the actions she subsequently took to ensure that she stayed on the throne and was able to hand it to her children. But before we launch into examining Grappina's reign, how about a quick refresher regarding Anaquist immediately before Grappina swept in? The early, the early, the early, the early. King Haldon I, Grappina's predecessor and cousin, had a troubled reign, not helped at all by his laziness and dilatory nature. 
It also wasn't helped by the clandestine campaign waged by Agrippina from a distance to displace him. A campaign of terror and supremely psychological manipulation where in the last years of his reign he was driven to distraction by targeted assassinations of his supporters and relatives, all by a foe that was, at the time, completely unknown, thus magnifying the terror. Grappina kept herself well away from Anaquist at the time, so she was never suspected of plotting until the last moment, when, after Haldon disappeared while out hunting, and his three adult children, Seltima, Ephraim and Abelard, were all said to have died on the same day at the hand of mysterious assassins, and then, the very next day, a band of yellow-clad soldiers strode into Anaquist and demanded entry for the heir to the throne, who was riding at their head. Well, the populace pretty much caved in and accepted Grappina as their monarch true heir? Maybe not, but as the granddaughter of Queen Salas II, she was of the royal family, and so she was the undisputed crowned head at least, at least for now. The way that Grappina seized the crown, after many years of clever and ruthless machinations, was the first instance of usurpation in Anaquistian history up until that time. And naturally, the first time that Varfina's choice, the uniquely Anaquistian method of succession, where the living monarch designates the heir from among their children, well, it was the first time it wasn't followed. Such an overturning of what had become the natural order was very much held to be responsible for the events that followed, with dark mutterings and fearful shaking of heads commonplace for years in taverns in and about Anaquist. It's like they could tell they had a bad moon arising. Rain highlight, 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 highlight. In a run-of-the-mill biography of any ruler, the first section is usually humdrum, with the ruler embarking on something usually called consolidating their rule. For Grappina, however, consolidation had a particular meaning, and it meant wiping out any rivals, any potential rivals, and anyone who had even thought of becoming a potential rival. We must remember that Grappina, in some ways, was a step back in the succession, so she was defying the expectations of the populace about the way succession worked in Anarchist. And that's not to mention the savagery with which she went about manoeuvring herself into the top job. King Haldon's children, having been killed, were no longer a threat to Grappina, but their children certainly were. Between them, Seltima, Ephraim and Abelard had five children, and once the situation became clear, their remaining family members fled Anarchist with the children. Sadly, this didn't deter Grappina. She sent assassins after all of them, with the result that Seltima's three offspring were all murdered while hiding in the city-state of Arenthia. And Abelard's sole child, a daughter, was abducted from a refuge in the far northern realm of Framen and never seen again. Ephraim and his four children disappeared while crossing the wilderness in search of a relative's holdings to the west of what in the present day is a kingdom of inner Honf. Several scholars have suggested that Grappina's actions here in seizing the throne indicate that she had many assassins at hand. Indeed, Sergei Chegny in The Black Company claims that she spent much of her time in exile assembling and training such a core, an elite company whose members had fanatical loyalty towards her. Whether or not she did, it was indisputable she was more than willing to use assassination as a tool. After the coronation and with Haldon's direct heirs disposed of, Grappina took a week or two to study Anarchist's aristocrats and then cut a sway through them. Loyalty was one issue, but any notable with riches or a following was immediately put in the suspicious basket by Grappina, and one did not stay in that basket for very long. After the first round of executions, a panicked exodus from Anarchus erupted. Some tried to liquidate holdings and tried to turn their fortunes into something portable, but many found that this took time, and time was not on their side. Those who managed to flee Anarchist were most often the ones who left everything behind. The Crown, naturally, confiscated titles, lands, buildings and riches of any of the nobles who were executed or who fled. You might think that Grappina used these to reward her favourites, but unlike nearly every other monarch in Anarchistian history... 
Queen Grappina had no favourites, no inner circle, no cronies. Whether this was because she was suspicious of nearly everybody or whether it was a deliberate demonstration that she was above and beyond everybody else is unclear. It almost goes without saying that this reign of terror wasn't good for business. It's a matter of uncertainty, I suppose. It's hard to plan for the next financial year when you're not sure whether you'll keep your head in the next fortnight or not. And of course, with so many pulling out of Anaquist because of the uncertainty about balance sheets and mortality, suddenly the Anaquist treasury was in a bit of a precarious state, with the sort of luck that one would hope would happen to the virtuous in 341 a minor heavenfall occurred in the far northwest of Anaquistian territory. Grappina quickly organised a well-armed expedition and claimed this prize, only having to fight off a small band of outlaws who found very quickly that they'd bitten off more than they could chew. The heavenfall was a small section of a belt with an attached buckle, 40 metres or so in length. Despite the protestations of the ecclesiasts from the temple who accompanied the expedition, Queen Grappina immediately had it broken up for easier transport and sale. The majority of scales were scintillating cerulean, highly prized at the time, and with the base material sought after for the magical power it had, the whole heavenfall gave a very useful and timely boost to the treasury. The Malbury Assassination Plot As you can imagine, Grappina's approach to ruling didn't win her many friends. It did, however, cultivate numerous enemies, even though they learned to be extremely circumspect, since being an enemy of Queen Grappina, or even a suspected enemy of Queen Grappina, was a shortcut to a shortcut. A number of clandestine groups met in extreme secrecy, but as well as having an extremely loyal bodyguard corps and a fanatical group of ready assassins, Grappina had the third leg of the despot's tripod, that of a highly efficient retinue of spies. Most of these clandestine disloyal groups were quickly infiltrated and liquidated thanks to the work of these undercover operatives. But in 352, a number of brave souls were able to organise themselves enough to make a real effort on the life of the tyrant. This came to be known as the Malbury Assassination Plot, after the main conspirator, Countess Lena Malbury. Most of what we know about the Malbury Assassination Plot comes from the writings by Elphia Malbury, a surviving member of the family writing in the late 5th century, some 150 years after the event. She claimed to have spoken to elderly family members and consolidated their memories into a narrative while insisting that she remained impartial and objective. The fact that all the plotters are portrayed as noble, self-sacrificing and heroic, while Queen Grappina and her lackeys are depraved, vicious and underhanded, perhaps gives the lie to this. But as it's the only near-contemporary record we have, there's no mention of this plot in any official source, it's all we have to go on, and all later accounts of the Malbury plot are necessarily based on Elphia Malbury's family history. The Malbury family was one of the oldest in Anaquist. Lena Malbury's great-great-great-grandmother, Hemnia Malbury, was one of those hardy and brave adventurers who accompanied Eucantha Anaquist on the expedition which found and claimed the heavenfall that was the foundation of the realm. For faithful service, she was granted land near what became the stronghold, the fortified area containing the keep, the royal palace, and underneath the fabulous Hypogeum, where the body of the dead god lay. Lena Malbury was in her early 20s when her mother spoke out against Queen Grappina's taxation laws at 356, a truly draconian but relatively egalitarian set of laws that aimed to extract as much money from as many people as possible. Lena's mother approached the Queen for an audience to discuss the matter and, unusually for her friends and relations, she wanted to address the hardship that these laws would bring to the common folk of Anaquist. She never returned from that trip to the palace. And that evening, assassins struck the Malbury mansion and turned it into a bloodbath. At the time, young Lena was out with friends and survived, but very wisely soon after fled the city for the countryside. Few people wanted anything to do with her. Friends shunned her, relatives slammed the door in her face, 
Acquaintances looked for her, but only so they could inform on her whereabouts and claim the reward. A distant cousin, Jancis Stetton, proved to be more steadfast. Her family had an olive-growing estate to the northeast of the castle, and Jancis, who was around the same age as Lena, persuaded her parents to take in the outcast. An incognito Lena worked for three years in helping to manage the olive farm, keeping books and general administration, but also using the time to sound out those who could be trusted beyond the Stetton family. Once she established a cabal of such, she and Jancis left the country estate and slipped back into the capital. There the plotting truly began. Lena and Jancis mostly worked with young Anaquistians, mainly as their connections lay in those directions, but also because many older, influential Anaquistians, those who might be expected to support a resistance to such a bloody dictator, well, they'd been killed in Queen Grappina's many purges. Those who remained had obviously shown a talent for not drawing attention to themselves and were thus not likely to support rebels of any sort. The Mulberry Cabal worked mostly from the townhouse of the Craxies family. The Craxies had left the capital for their mountain villa in north-east of Anaquist, but the second son, Allo, remained behind. He already had a reputation as a hothead and a firebrand, and had narrowly escaped the notice of the Queen's spies on a number of occasions when he undertook acts of petty sabotage and vandalism as a sign of his displeasure with the regime. He was a willing recruit to the cause, even though both Lena and Jancis admitted that he was a potential loose cannon. Various schemes were discussed over the months that the three plotters lived secretly in the city, only setting foot outside at night. Poison was a favourite for some time, but put aside when the difficulties of getting the ingredients became apparent, after Jancis attempted to buy such from an apothecary, who was rumoured to be greedy and tight-lipped. Fortunately, before delivery, Lena accompanied Jancis to the apothecary's shop and insisted they wait in the shadows and watch the place for some time from a nearby rooftop. Her wariness was rewarded when soldiers surrounded the shop before entering and dragging out the apothecary, in the end, Lena and Jacinta came to the conclusion that, well guarded as Grappina was by her loyal bodyguards, getting close enough to poison, stab or otherwise dispatch the Queen was verging on the impossible. They were going to have to rely on Lena's breathtaking slinging skills that she'd developed during the time in the country. Vermin were a major problem in the olive groves, with many of the large monitor lizards addicted to feasting on olives, ripe or unripe and thereby ruining many a harvest. These lizards moved deceptively quickly and were fierce in close quarters, so roving bands of slingers patrolled the groves to keep the numbers down. Young Lena learned from the best of these and soon was renowned as among the best of the best. Elphia Mulberry tells of the fateful day when the plot came to a climax. Despite his misgivings, Allocraxes procured a room in a building overlooking the route that the black-hearted queen was to take that morning on the way to the flogging post, where the wretched victims of her displeasure were to be beaten that day. With spirit, Allo argued that he should be the one to bring down the tyrant, but his skills with the sling were palpably worse than that of Lena, and he left them, storming out to find strong drink, his customary solace. Along with her well-armoured retinue, the vile monarch rode her horse through streets that were empty, no commoner willing to risk her gaze falling on them and finding them insolent, insincere or deficient in any way. Jancis embraced Lena and wished her well, then handed her the sling. Lena tested the sling and she weighed a smooth lead sling stone in her hand. With certainty in her heart that she could strike the monster dead, she strode to the window. Before she could let loose, however, the fiend stopped, and her bodyguards swarmed close, entirely enclosing her in large shields. The door to the room burst open, and troops overwhelmed Lena and Jancis, though they fought with all their strength. They were taken to the dungeons beneath the barracks of the palace guard. There they died hideous deaths, alongside Allocraxes, whose loose talk had betrayed Lena and Jancis, much to his sorrow. Now, 
This was the inevitable fate of every conspiracy against Queen Grippina, betrayal, discovery and death. It's not to say that her rule was unchallenged, but every challenge was dealt with quickly and ruthlessly. The War with Orenthia While dealing ruthlessly with internal affairs, external affairs vexed Queen Grappina. Her haughty and disdainful manner was well and good in her own land, where she had absolute power, but outsiders were less impressed. Instead of delegating trade negotiations to trusted negotiators and administrators, she trusted no one after all, she insisted on conducting trade negotiations herself. The result was that Anaquis precarious finances floundered even more, with trading partners unhappy with taxation and tariff arrangements unilaterally declared by Queen Grappina. When this unhappiness grew and complaints were made to non-compliance rife, Grappina, confident in Anaquis' central role in trade throughout the continent, ordered mass confiscation of goods and the execution of a number of foreign merchants residing in Anaquist in an extreme case of making an example of someone. This sort of high-handed dealing continued until, in 359, the major trading state of Arenthia declared war on Anaquist. In Season 2 of this podcast, I recounted a number of minor conflicts between Anaquist and Arenthia. Despite the fact that they were major trading partners and this arrangement brought great prosperity to both realms, friction between them was almost a constant in their relationship. The difference in their systems of government was perhaps at the root of this, with the classical monarchy in Anaquist and Arenthia being a proud oligarchy, with some pretension of being a modern state. After a number of skirmishes, Grappina herself led the Anaquist army in the Battle of Torbreck Hill in 360. This battle is not one of Anaquist's finest moments, but in Arenthia, until its demise and disappearance as an independent realm, every spring equinox, the Battle of Torbreck Hill, was celebrated as Arenthia's finest military victory. The Anaquist army numbered something close to 30,000. The Arenthians, only 10,000. But thanks to the Arenthians having an excellent position and making the Anaquistians fight uphill and the rainy weather making the hillside boggy and hampering the overly confident Anaquistians as they slogged toward the well-set Arenthians, and then the skill and endurance of the Arenthian slingers with their well-formed lead sling bullets sending a rain of deadly shot down upon the Anaquistians, the day became a slaughter. Much to her displeasure, Grappina was forced to sue for peace, after which she had all the army commanders executed. Trade resumed, and uneasy prosperity settled on Anaquist. The Succession In the last year of her life, Grappina finally made it clear who would be the next monarch of Anaquist. She summoned her children, who by this time had grown to adulthood, and most of them had left the border fort to take various commands across the continent, much as their maternal grandfather had. Grappina chose Zalman to be her successor, but in a move unprecedented, she produced a document that's unique in Anaquistian history. She not only designated Zalman as her successor, but then she mandated that Yefen would follow him, then Enna would follow him, with Keska taking the crown after Enna. This, of course, was inconsistent with Varfina's choice method of succession, instituted by Queen Varfina in 278, and followed by every monarch since, where they chose their successor, but never attempted to bind the succession after that. We'll see what happened to the subsequent succession in the next episode. Personal life. Queen Grappina married the commander of her bodyguard, Finn Clon, in 392, and not simply because he was afraid not to. He was a stern, methodical man, happy to carry out her most heinous orders. It had been no secret they'd been lovers for some time, and while they'd lived separately, they managed to have four children. Zalman, born in 322, Yefen born in 323, Yenna in 325, and Keska being a latecomer, born in 334. 
After that, Finn Clon was soon pensioned off for the small estate in the south of Anaquist near the mouth of the Geffo River, on the other side to the port town of Miro. Elfia Mulberry says that he never saw Grappina again and her account of Grappina's mothering needs to be taken with truckloads of salt, but she says that she was torn in her upbringing of them. Grappina wanted to perpetuate her line and so needed a strong heir to follow her on the throne, which led her to raise her children strictly, with much time spent in learning all the arts of governing according to Grappina. They had little time for games, idleness or softness, according to Elphia Melbury, and beatings were frequent. As they grew older, however, Grappina became more and more concerned that her offspring wouldn't wait for her to die or to hand over the crown, that the ambition she cultivated and the ruthlessness she insisted upon would leave them rankled and frustrated at not being in charge. She began to see preemptive strikes in their eyes, and so when Anna reached the age of 15 in 350, she had the three oldest, Zalman, Yefen and Anna, sent to a border fort in the far west of Anaquist with orders for the commander to keep them there and teach them the military life. This left the youngest, Keska, in the palace with the Queen, where she stayed until Grappina died in 371. As for Grappina's personality, likes and dislikes, hobbies and such, well, the picture we have of her is coloured somewhat by the bloody way she came to the throne and the ruthless way she held on to it. Every source we have seems to be appalled by her and the descriptions that survive can't really be said to be overflowing with nuance. She was bad, nasty and bad, seems to be the whole of it. If we dig more deeply, and that's what I'm here for, deep digging, we can surmise that she was an extremely good planner and administrator. She was also no fool. Coins issued during her reign show her to be somewhat stern of gaze, but still with the usual Anaquistian good looks. One apocryphal anecdote survives that recounts that she had trouble sleeping, especially later in her reign, and would roam the corridors and walkways of the palace at night, entirely clad in black, her countenance formidably frosty. Guards were warned not to challenge or engage with any long, cool woman in a black dress that they might encounter, not if they valued their own lives at all. Last words. Queen Grappina was a usurper, but if the measure of the success of a usurpation is that they hold on to the crown and pass it to their heir, well, she was a successful usurper. She was cruel, inordinately so, and sometimes to her detriment. Living in Anaquist during her reign was a fraught experience, and the land lost many of its most important and useful people as they fled her ruthlessness. And the rest of the continent was the winner here, gaining expertise, knowledge and skill, particularly in scale-related magic, fabrication and trade. Grappina died in 371 and wasn't mourned at all. Her death wasn't celebrated, however, as her son and successor Zalman was cast much in the same mould as his mother, and fear still stalked the land. In the annals, the official record of each monarch's reign, Grappina describes herself as firm but fair. That's all. Firm, but fair. It's the briefest entry in the entire annals. And that's it for episode 22 of the World Below the War in the Heavens podcast. Coming up next, King Zalman the Vicious. Until then, farewell and may the heavens smile upon you. This has been The World Below the War in the Heavens, a podcast exploring the history, culture and esoterica of the world below, a continent of magic and mystery with inhabitants who keep one eye on the sky at all times. I've been your host, Michael Pryor. If you'd like to find out more about me and my books, pop over to www.michaelpryor.com.au. Farewell. Farewell.